People ask me this all the time, how I became interested in pirates, and the assumption is that I was always fascinated with pirates, and I was not at all. In fact, I never dressed as a pirate, I never talked like a pirate. I never knew a Spaniard what didn't carry treasure, be she a galleon or man of war. Eh. Hard to love her! Harbor, aye, aye. Clear them latchings from the guns and prepare for battle. Aye. Aye. I actually went to grad school at Harvard to study fatherhood in early America. And so I was in my third year in grad school and I wrote this paper that I thought was going to be a chapter of the dissertation. I was pretty happy with what I had uh, and it presented it to a group of faculty including my advisor and a number of other uh, graduate students. Uh, and they said, you know, the last four pages are the best part of this, this chapter. You know, it, the pirates are the most interesting part. And I said, wow, it's a fun way of ending the story but it is not the main part of the story. So I said, okay, what I'm going to do is give you a month, and I'm going to spend a month in the archives, and I'm going to read government records, uh, trial records, letters from uh, governors back to uh, England. Uh, and if it seems significant, then I'll study it. Otherwise, I'm going back to my old topic. And so I spent a, about a month, and pirates were everywhere, everywhere. And they were living in Newport, Rhode Island in particular, in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, and they were not at all the pirates we thought they were. They were swashbuckling for a moment. They would go into the Indian Ocean and attack Muslim pilgrimage vessels. Uh, but they would arrive in Newport and buy land and become customs collectors, or they'd marry local women. And so I became really fascinated with the fact that no one had written about these pirates who are not necessarily the way we imagine pirates. They were people who committed at piracy once in their lives and moved on uh, to do other things. And so the book that I ended up writing that came out of my dissertation uh, is a book about the relationship of these pirates with the communities that welcomed them on land. Uh, and they became integrated with, with the community. And since then, I've been com uh, completely wrapped and fascinated with pirates, but it was something that came out of historical serendipity. So when I first arrived at UCSD as a junior faculty member, I was preparing to teach my Golden Age of Piracy class, and I was uh, initially, I met with Linda Clausen, who's the director of special collections at UCSD. And she approached me to say, you know, we have one of the strongest collections on Pacific voyages in the entire world, and in fact, one of the strongest piracy collections in the entire world. And so before I started teaching the class, I went and explored the, the collection and found that we did indeed have almost every significantly printed text from the 17th and 18th century, the period that we would call the Golden Age. We owned a copy, typically a first edition of everything that, was, that came from that period. Well, the Hill Collection is well known because of its scope. It very much focuses on the Pacific, largely, and a particular period, pre-1850, when people were still discovering half of the world, as it were. And UCSD gets some of its reputation um, in the world of collectors and collecting because we are active collectors in that area. It's an interesting... Um, little tidbit because the universe I live in, the rare, rare book and special collection world, there's a universe of dealers, people who deal in rare books, manuscripts, etc. And there's always a little phrase, you know, they want you to know how rare something is. Um, for the voyage material, it's always not in hill, which is like an alert. Not just to me, because I find that a very vexing <laughs> thing. It's like, oh no, do we have enough money to buy this? Um, but that's something that people around the world are very, very familiar with. It's not a journal. It's more of a very um, descriptive log, and it's very specific. One of the key aspects of the Age of Sail course has been having students read original log books, and log books. Uh, are the sort of central uh, information storehouse of a ship. Uh, they're essential to recording every single thing that happens on a ship, wind direction changes, deaths on a ship, encounters with other ships at sea, experiences in port. Uh, and a lot of them include poems and songs, and, and a lot of them have watercolor paintings and things. I tell students all the time that history is not necessarily only what happened in the past, it's also the way we construct a story or a narrative about the past based on the sources we have available to us. So it's essential to understand that history, history is a construct. It's something we build and we create and we fight over. And if we didn't fight over it, historians wouldn't have jobs. So we battle and, and we debate over these things. And to have a student really look at an original document and try to construct their own narrative, what, what is it about this? 
One of the things uh, historians, particularly early modern historians, really struggle with is getting students to understand the reality of what the world was like for someone living in the early modern period. We're also going to uh, be doing different types of stations throughout the, throughout the ship where we talk about you know, whether it's uh, the sail anatomy or, or, or what, what different types of ships were used for during you know, different time periods and how that rig would have looked. In all my classes that I teach, I always say that the one attribute that is most significant to a successful historian is empathy. Uh, and when I say empathy, I mean sort of trying to understand the particular circumstances and context of another person's life that is so far different from you. For my work, I have people empathize with some of the craziest people you can possibly imagine, anarchistic maniacs who put matchsticks in their beards so that smoking when they board ships. And these are people that you couldn't imagine trying to understand and, uh, and empathize with. And that's what I try to do on a daily basis is grasp why would, I do, why would they do that thing? What, what, what is it that they were born and raised and understanding that makes it okay for them to do that? It's not meant for human beings to be at the sea. It is a hostile environment. Uh, and so uh, for students to understand the dangers, uh, the, the, the inherent fear involved with being in a maritime world and on a ship. The best way to deal with a man overboard is don't have one. So I'm going to ask you to stay. And then other issues, even social issues, uh, even if you're only on ship for four hours, you get a sense of, uh, what if I got to fight with another person? Well, I can only have about 150 feet uh, that I could separate myself from that person over a long period of time. And if you understand that, you understand why a captain's power and authority over a crew is so incredibly significant. Because if things fall apart, you need orders to be followed, you need order to be had, and, be con and you need the ship to be controlled, and, and you need the sails to be handled properly. And I think when you're there, even in those four hours, you find it's remarkable to see how quickly students understand obeying orders. Bumps clear, on the floor, hold away the halyards. Hold away! Hand over hand. This year, beginning in February and ending in September, the Natural History Museum is hosting a large traveling exhibit called Real Pirates. It's about a pirate ship that was discovered in the 1980s uh, by a man named Barry Clifford, uh, that was the ship Witta, uh, that we know foundered off of Cape Cod. He discovered it in the 80s, and over the many years, he's pulled off amazing uh, material, including treasure, bells, cannon, uh, a boy's femur and his sock. One of the interesting problems for the museum, to some extent, was that it didn't fit well with the, with the broad mission of the Natural History Museum, which, of course, is to describe natural history, uh, fossils, plants, animals, uh, and the natural world around them, in particular, the local San Diego. And I said, well, that's interesting, because it does actually fit quite well, uh, because uh, natural history as we know it today was, in fact, uh, the product in many respects of pirates. Pirates are really the original citizen scientists. They were not trained, they are not noblemen, aristocrats. They weren't even members of the Royal Society of London, one of the first scientific societies still in existence today. Uh, but they saw everything that people in those societies could not see or had no opportunity to see. And we created this local component uh, to uh, describe essentially the role pirates played in the rise of natural history primarily using the books that I use for my Golden Age of Piracy class, uh, the books that students will actually read the originals. One of the things that my students over the years of teaching my pirates class found sort of shocking and strange was I would have them read original documents from the 17th and 18th century about piracy, uh, and they always found it shocking that the majority of what they were reading were about descriptions of plants and animals, and only a small percentage was about swashbuckling piracy at sea. You could read a 300-page document and have 20 pages involving violence and the rest describing flamingos and hummingbirds and seals. We're delighted when museums, galleries, we do this quite often, not always just for the institutions here in town, but if they can use our materials in an exhibition that they're doing, it's a wonderful way to have a partnership between the university and another institution in town. It makes our materials far more widely available to an audience that wouldn't necessarily come up to UCSD to see something. Because it's a, 
a show that is themed around pirates. I think it has a very popular appeal, and a lot of people will come to see the pirate ships and all the sunken treasure and stuff like that, but they'll also have an opportunity to see some of the science and what real life was like for these people who went out on the ships. About a year ago, Linda asked me to be uh, the honorary curator of the Hill Collection of Pacific Voyages. And what that has now entailed uh, is uh, actually much more involvement in acquisitions. Uh, and the Hill Collection began in 1974. It was a donation with Kenneth and Dorothy Hill with really their own collection. But since then, it also included a large amount of money. And because of that, we've been using that money to purchase a series of original documents, primary sources, log books, printed texts from the early modern period. When buying this, I don't do this sort of willy-nilly. I actually have a series of, uh, of rules and sort of ideas of how I want to build the collection in particular, and particularly building on its own strength. So really anything uh, that is Pacific Voyages, I, we try to acquire if we don't have it already, and particularly if we have a good volume of it. Uh, the other is teaching. Can I teach this book? Can I teach it in my piracy class? Can I teach it in Age of Sail? Is this something I can use to teach? And often the, that means I tend to look for primary source documents, original manuscript documents more than others. And the important element of this is that it combines uh, the three elements that I think academics are really supposed to perform uh, in a university system, which is teaching. Uh, the other is service, which is working with the community and, and promoting the Hill Collection as not merely a collection for UCSD, but a collection for the community. And the other uh, is research. So people will come here from around the world to do research uh, on these documents. Uh, and it's an unusual and, and an amazing collection for that particular purpose.